Good evening, welcome. I'm John. I'm a bookseller at Literati Bookstore in downtown Ann Arbor, Michigan. We're so pleased to welcome Benjamin Cunningham, Cunningham, excuse me, in support of The Liar to our At Home uh, with Literati series this evening in conversation with Stephen Delbos. Uh, just a quick webinar overview for those of you who are just joining us. The chat is closed this evening, but you can keep the chat window open. I'll be sharing links to purchase The Liar from Literati Bookstore throughout the event. Then you can interact with us at any time using the Q&A feature that's available to you on your toolbar. Please submit questions there and I'll ask a selection of them at the conclusion of the conversation this evening. And the live transcription is available to you as well on your toolbar using the CC icon. If you're watching us later on YouTube, there are always links to purchase books in the description directly below me. You can also click on the little typewriter at the bottom corner of the screen there to subscribe to our channel and be kept up to date with all of our at home with Literati events and be notified once they reach our channel. And as a reminder, you can shop for more books at literatibookstore.com to have shipped to your home anywhere in the United States. And if you live in Southeast Michigan or the Ann Arbor area, our doors are open to the public for in-store shopping. But most of all, we would just like to thank you for your attendance this evening or this afternoon or much later this evening and Stephen and Benjamin's case, or maybe this morning, depending on where and when in the world you may be joining us. So without further ado, I'll introduce tonight's author and our interlocutor, Benjamin Cunningham, who's a correspondent for The Economist. He covered Central and Eastern Europe for six years and now writes about the wider Mediterranean region for Barcelona. In addition, he contributes to The Guardian, The Los Angeles Review of Books, Aspen Review, Le Monde Diplomatique, and is an opinion columnist for SME, Slovakia's main daily newspaper. He is a PhD candidate at the University of Barcelona, and he grew up in Novi, Michigan. Speaking with him this evening, Stephen Delbos, the first poet laureate of Plymouth, Massachusetts, is an award-winning poet, translator, playwright, essayist, and editor. His most recent poetry collection is Small Talk. He has translated widely from Czech, including... Uh, the Paris Notebooks, and The Absolute Gravedigger, which garnered a Penn Heim translation grant. His scholarly work includes the New American Poetry and Cold War Nationalism. He's a founding editor of the web journal Body. Please join me in welcoming Benjamin Cunningham and Stephen Delbos into your living rooms. Great. Uh, thanks for the introduction and thanks everybody for joining us. Uh, it's great to have this chance to talk with Ben about his new, new book. Um, we've known each other for more than a decade. And uh, so, yeah, really excited to dig in. And so, Ben, um, give us the elevator pitch for those of us, uh, or for those who in, in the audience who might not have um, made their way through the whole book yet. Um, what's, what's at the heart of this book, The Liar? And uh, why is it a compelling tale? Let me, let me, preempt that uh, by, by also just want to thank Literati for having us. Uh, um, you know, uh, I'm from the area and I've been through the bookstore a few times and uh, they don't make them, uh, they don't make them that way anymore. Uh, so really glad that uh, we're able to have this event and especially even to facilitate this event sort of in this sort of unique format. Um, so happy to be here. So as for the book, um, you know, uh, I was working as a journalist in Prague and, and um, sort of stumbled across this sort of urban legend, uh, you know, got wind of this, you know, bits and pieces of this uh, story. And, the, you know, the main sort of thrust of it is um, Carl and Hannah Kocher, a husband and wife, uh, moved to the United States in 1965. Um, and they are sleeper agents, communist sleeper agents. They pose as essentially refugees fleeing uh, persecution in, in Central Europe. Um, Carl's mission is essentially to penetrate, uh, you know, the upper echelons of, of American society and the U.S. government. And he actually succeeds in doing that. So by 19, there's a few twists and turns. 1973, he actually gets a job inside the CIA. And then he proceeds to, from working inside the CIA, send information back to the uh, Eastern Bloc, um, the coaches, all told, uh, they, they moved there in 1965 and they're in the States until 1980. Well, uh, Carl was eventually arrested in 1984. So going on two decades as sort of living a lie, uh, the, the, the title of the book, The Liar. Um, so that's sort of the, the main you know, thrust of the book. But, but 
what really, you know, kind of got my juices flowing is as I kind of, you know, I, as I said, I got this sort of um, urban legend version of this story. And, you know, a lot of urban legends are more interesting than the real thing. They tend to be. That's what makes them legends. And, and for me, the opposite happened. Kind of each, each step I took in research and each, each you know, every, the more I learned, the more layers uh, seemed to emerge to this story. So I tried to, you know, I just kept going and kept pulling at, I'm mixing metaphors here, pulling at threads, unpeeling layers, and um, I couldn't stop really. And, and then at some point, the problem became uh, the opposite. I had so much uh, interesting stuff. It was really a matter of uh, choosing, you know, paring it down and, um, you know, and, 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 and putting it together in a way that, that would, um, you know, be compelling to an audience. Yeah, yeah. And so I believe he was the first, and maybe not the only, but the first uh, STB or KGB agent who successfully infiltrated the CIA, correct? Uh, so yeah, so the STB, essentially the, the then Czechoslovakia, still the Czech-Oslovak uh, version of the KGB, uh, the STB, um, it's actually a, even broader than that. He is, um, so there's a differentiation between um, spies that work under cover of di diplomatic cover. And then there are spies that are um, called illegals. Uh, so illegals are people that have no cover. So you, a typical spy actually tends to work out of an embassy. They're, they have a job as like cultural attache at the embassy. And they, um, if they are caught, they are uh, arrested and deported. They have diplomatic immunity. Uh, illegals pretend to be somebody they're not, move into the country. If they are caught, they go to prison or are executed depending on the country that you're in. So he is the, uh, Carl is the only known illegal to ever successfully infiltrate the CIA from any country. So in terms of somebody whose mission it was to move to the United States illegally, pretend to be someone they weren't and actually succeed in getting a job inside the CIA, he's the only one that uh, that's known to have done that. Other people, traders, American traders have spied for foreign governments inside the CIA. Um, you know, there's been, um, um, you know, people who have received secrets from Americans that they transmit overseas. But in terms of someone who moved to the States undercover and then managed to penetrate the CIA, he's the only one. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, so, you know, there's a great degree of uh, local color in the book. Uh, the book opens with this interrogation scene in a small village. Um, and, you know, the detail that you bring to it is clearly from you know, having been in Prague, spent a lot of time in, in the region and everything. Can you talk a little bit about how you did hear about this urban legend, uh, how you kind of started to get a little bit closer to Carol at the end of the book? And I mean, it's obvious throughout that you have a great deal of kind of contact with him. But then the last chapter actually goes into a, one of your meetings with him. So can you talk a little bit about how, you know, how did you first hear about the story and how did you eventually get to the point where you were actually going over to his house multiple times and recording interviews? Yeah, so, so um, you know, I was a journalist in Prague and I just knew people and, and you know, was working all the time. Uh, Stephen and I worked for a while together as journalists at a newspaper. Um, I guess I don't remember where I first heard the story. I got to tell you, I heard it here and there. And, uh, you know, you're at a, a, a pub or whatever, and there's some story comes up from some some local. And um, and by the time I kind of started to wade into this, I, you know, I knew some people around town. And so I tried to, you know, find Carl. And um, it took a few emails and a few calls, but, you know, a couple, you know, three degrees of separation or something. I was able to, to, to get his contact information and I contacted him. And he was basically willing to talk. Um, and so I started, he lives, uh, still lives. Uh, he's 88 now, going to be 89. And he might have just turned 89. Around now, he's turning 89. Um, he um, lives in this village outside of Prague. And I sort of went to his house and just kind of started meeting with him. And, and just kind of, it went from there. Uh, um, you know, initially, it was sort of just a feeling out process, you know, trying to, you know, a little bit have him, you know, trust me a little bit that he would you know open up a bit more and it went on for a while we, we ended up having long conversations six seven hours you know went out to lunch kind of kept it going i'd say the other part of the details that are really important and, and, and in particular that opening uh that opening you know the opening of the book which is a real 
interrogation that happened. So the book is, of course, nonfiction. So um, that's verbatim um, sort of a conversation that was had behind, between uh, Carl and uh, a guy from the KGB, a general in the KGB, an interrogation. Materials like that and just real, raw, you know, details. Um, I went through files. There were um, the STB, uh, after the collapse of communism, the STB archives were declassified. So there's these massive, uh, this massive cache of files that you, that's open to the public. Um, the, the trouble is you have to manually, <laughs> manually go through them all. But, but um, when you do that, there are these, you know, pieces of gold. And so, you know, as an example, that opening, um, that opening sort of scene in the book is a real conversation that really happened between people. There's recordings of it. There's a transcript of it. There's uh, actually photos. There's photos in the insert of the book of that day um, as well. Um, so you're even, you know, in that chapter, I can tell you what kind of tie the guy was wearing in that room. So that's another thing that, you know, as I said earlier, you kind of take those steps forward and you kind of find these things and you're like, man, this is better and better and better. And if I, you know, if I just do a good job of, of putting these pieces together, there's really something here. Yeah. And uh, I believe, you know, initially you wrote uh, an article and then continued to develop it into a book. Uh, the research is you know clear and 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 really impressive throughout the book everything from uh you know issues of the new york times in the 50s or the 60s to the, these files that you mentioned um beyond it just being a kind of really classic cold war war you know tale what was it that as you said got your juices flowing and i mean you did a ton of work for this book what was it that uh, kind of convinced you that this was worth pursuing? Yeah, so I think um, meeting Carl, there's a couple and there's, there's more than a couple. I can list a couple though. Um, you know, um, meeting Carl, you kind of meet a guy like this and you become, um, you know, really interested in the psychology of a person that kind of gets into this, that, that functions in this world. I mean, literally somebody who lies to their next door neighbor about who they are for 20 consecutive years, wakes up every morning with that sort of mindset that they kind of have to do that, you know, or might die, that sort of thing. Um, so the psychology of that, and, and I guess it was, it was, you know, how many spy stories or spy movies I had seen where, you know, now I felt like I was stumbling into the real version of that, a real person. And I never really, I don't know, you know, you watch a James Bond movie, you know, I, you don't, there's not like a deep exploration of what, what the motives are of this guy or something like that. It's an extreme example, but even grittier spy dramas, there, there, there are some that try to do it, but, but, you know, to have this opportunity to, to be, you know, drilling down into the real thing, that's number one. I, you know, it was, it was sort of like, you know, insane. Um, I guess the, the, the obvious thing that was also intriguing too, was that, you know, I'm, I grew up in Novi as, as we said during the introduction, grew up in the States. And, and so, you know, there's a certain sort of narrative of the Cold War that sort of you grow up with and, and sort of prevails. And this was at least an attempt, you know, an opportunity to try and view it through, um, you know, through a different lens. And I thought that maybe people would be, in I was interested in that and I was hopeful that other people would be. It doesn't mean you have to, you have to like the, the character or like the guy or whatever, but to at least, you know, kind of flip, uh, flip the camera around a little bit. And then I guess the last bit is, is the, you know, it's a little bit of a boring part, but the, the archives and how detailed they were, it was this, regardless of the story, it was on, you know, this rare opportunity to be able to, you know, have a nonfiction story with the detail of a, of a novel. You know, you actually, like I actually, you know, there are many times when I was writing this where I kind of wished I was writing fiction because it would have been easier. Right. I could have just invented the temperature in the room or, or whatever. And instead you had to find, you know, you couldn't always find the, the, the little detail you wanted. So you made do with what you could, but you would find these little pieces, this little stuff, what they had for what was on the receipt of a, of a you know, a, you know, there's receipts from when they had a meeting, you know, so someone could claim an expense and you can kind of figure out what they had for lunch that day. And it's just it's it's just these little 
itty bitty, you know, granular details. And I just didn't know, you know, I couldn't imagine the opportunity to have that kind of color and, 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 you know, you know, granular focus on a, on a real true story. Uh, it just seemed like, you know, irresponsible not to, not to, to, to do it once you found it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a good position to be in. And I think for those of you who haven't read it yet, the, you know, the detail, the granularity really is kind of novelistic and uh, to combine that, that kind of vision and eye and writing with the research, it, it's really one of the strengths of the book. Um, one of the many strengths. And I do want to get into that, uh, the lens of the Cold War uh, in, in a minute. But uh, for now, I, I'd like to delve a little bit more into the psychology of uh, Carol. And, um, you know, what a character, what an extraordinary person. Uh, you know, he he's fluent in three or four languages or more. Uh, you know, is precocious from a young age. He has a has a kind of tumultuous relationship with his father, who ends up writing a letter to the film school to kind of dissuade them from allowing him to study film and things like that. Um, and then, you know, obviously carries this on successfully for decades, and and now is alive and and well, and you know, seemingly pleased with uh, his life's efforts. Um, can you talk a little bit about what makes this guy tick? Uh, where is he coming from? You know, is he an extraordinary individual or just uh, a, a normal individual put into extraordinary circumstances? So I, I think he's an extraordinary individual. And then one of the things that I kind of clicked in my head really early on in this process, and, and, and history is a big part of the story, I really try and like some historical context kind of running through it. I mean, uh, you know, the guy was born in uh, 1934, um, lived through Nazi invasion of, uh, occupation of Czechoslovakia, communist takeover of Czechoslovakia, 60s in the U.S., kind of really hits on these sort of Cold War sort of, you know, touchstones. Um, but like, a, you know, the, the, the sort of luck or misfortune of time and place. And so, um, you know, the guy is hyper intelligent. And, you know, I, I, I really early on, I, I thought to myself, you know, like if this guy had been born in 1970 in Palo Alto, California, right? What would his life trajectory have been, right? He would be, uh, you know, this is how, you know, he would be a, 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 Steve know, Jones. a wealthy man, right? A wealthy, yeah. at least if not famous, definitely wealthy, successful, whatever. He was born in the 1930s in Czechoslovakia. He basically, his, you know, adolescence was in communist Czechoslovakia. And for a hyper-intelligent, a little bit uh, anti-authoritarian type of character with ambitions, uh, you know, that was not a system that accommodated that, uh, that sort of person. And so he was alienated from society at that point. He moved to the States. Uh, his early sort of years in the States, he actually does quite well. He gets a PhD from Columbia, not easy to do. He gets that job at the CIA. That takes eight, eight years, though. I mean, he's in the States eight years. Um, but then he kind of levels off, you know. He's kind of, um, he's kind of an outsider there, too. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, you know, kind of in the end, he goes back to communist, still communist Czechoslovakia in 1986, believes himself to be, um, um, you know, he thinks he's going to be greeted there like a hero because he has been, he's pulled off this coup of penetrating the CIA and living in, you know, in the United States for 20 years. This must be uh, worthy of celebration. But he returns and no one trusts him. He's been in the U.S. for 20 years. So they assume he's, he's gone native or, or he's, you know, maybe he's working for the CIA against them. And then the last twist of the knife is that um, you know, he's, he's a communist and communism collapses three years after he returns. And so he's now really an outside, someone who was an STB, you know, a high profile STB figure is persona non grata in the nineties and the two thousands. So the psychology that I, you know, the underlying core thing that I, you know, hyper confident, hyper capable guy that constantly is pissed off and aggrieved and trusts no one and makes radical decisions all the time 
He's often looking out for himself, but often with good cause because people are trying to murder him or screw him over or whatever. And so, you know, that in the psychology point of it, it's, it's a two, it's a two way street. It's, it's, it's kind of like the seeds are planted. And as you mentioned, had a difficult, you know, home life as a kid. So you kind of already have this sort of, this sort of not being recognized for, you know, being a, 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 a very intelligent, high achieving kid, not even getting that sort of recognition at home kind of follows him through his entire life, but also then being in these kind of pressure cooker situations, which then, you know, it, it feeds, feeds the wheel, feeds the wheels that, that he sort of, um, you know, he doesn't trust people and increasingly doesn't have a reason to trust people <laughs> at any given time. And that, that, that's, you know, that makes, that heightens the tension almost pressure cooker is the word. I mean, I'd say it's certainly the first two thirds or three quarters of the book. It, at least if I did it well enough, you, you know, um, feels like it's things are just being ratcheted up slowly, but continuously. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. I mean, he, in the, on the one hand is, is the ultimate insider, but also a permanent outsider in a way. Right. Exactly. Um, it's important to mention that he didn't do it alone, right? And his wife, Hannah, played a, a kind of increasingly important role and towards the end of his stay in the US was almost a more reliable contact for uh, hand off, handing off information and, and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about her role, her character and where she fits in this whole puzzle? Yeah, so Hannah is also a really interesting um, even my own experience with Hana is interesting. And, and actually, I, I really wanted to um, um, have as much as I could about her in the book. Um, it was more difficult, though. Uh, she was much uh, more reticent to speak to me. She did not trust me at all. Carl, I think, is a little bit, um, um, you know, feels like he didn't get credit for some of the things he did. So he kind of wants to, to you, know, wants, you know, wants to talk about him. She doesn't trust, you know, her life experience has taught her not to trust people and she didn't trust me. Um, she's also not, um, as she wasn't the primary sort of spy, um, the documentation, the historical documentation is much less than her. But she is interest, none, in, nonetheless interesting and met her and, and um, had some, uh, some conversations with her. She was, uh, she came from a, like a loyalist communist family. And so uh, she was kind of, um, um, in, in, you know, by all accounts, kind of a simple young girl because of the sort of social environment that she grew up in. It was, a, you know, the 50s in Czechoslovakia, not a, not a high time for feminism uh, in the world. Um, her family, her, her father was basically a, um, a, 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 you know, a Communist Party operative, like a, like a bureaucrat. He was a, he managed a factory and then a switchboard or something. So a real, like, you know, classic sort of working class guy that got a job that he didn't really earn because of loyalty. So sort of a, um, she was working as basically, she did learn languages. She was working as a translator. And then when Carol and her got married, she was only 19 years old. When they moved to the States, she was only 19 years old and he's about 10 years older than her. So there's a lot of sort of balls in the air here. She kind of comes from a, a background where women were supposed to be quiet and, and um, um, you know, uh, you know, play somewhat of a traditional role. She's quite young when she gets thrown into this, you know, cauldron or whatever. Um, she's married to an older guy who's a pretty confident guy. And so um, she's kind of a really a fish out of water in her first se good several years in, in, in the U.S. She kind of, through sort of the expat community there, stumbles into a job, though, uh, working in diamonds in Manhattan, which is another, you know, really colorful sort of sidebar part of this story. So she's a diamond. She becomes a diamond dealer. She sort of starts at a low level, but she's a worker and kind of uh, advances and eventually is sort of a partner with uh, uh, her and Carl are partners with, a, with an older um, Slovak emigre who uh, operates in the diamond district. So she kind of grows in confidence and then, you know, really is flying to Geneva, flying to Israel to, you know, where people are polishing diamonds and, and making kind of international diamond deals. And then, as you note, um, this is apparent in the files. The, the, the STB sort of, you know, management is, is really skeptical of her as a young, young woman. 
kind of just don't think she has the, the, the gumption to, to make this happen. And um, by the sort of the end of their tenure in the state, she's playing a, a, um, a pretty integral role in sort of facilitating contacts between you know, supervisors and Carl and passing messages and things like that. And the files really reflect that sort of, um, you know, increased, um, you know, she grew up, she grew up probably real, real fast and more than, uh, um, and in ways that, 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 uh, some of us will never <laughs> grow up. I mean, the, the, the intensity forces you to either, you know, sink or swim kind of situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, intensity, I think, is the right word for it. And it's it's just so interesting when you do read the book. It's not just the intensity of the spy craft, but yeah, I mean, she's flying all over the world dealing diamonds. Uh, they're swinging in Manhattan. There's just uh, so much going on. It's really right. An I mean, we should highlight story. that. That's one more sort of real, you know, colorful. There's a million of them, but a colorful in the 70s in particular. Both Carl and Hannah are sort of, you know, they live a pretty uh, vibrant uh, social life, including sort of in the sort of wife swapping or, or spouse swapping, let's say, swinger scene, parties. Uh, they live up on the on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. It's kind of a kind of a, you know, wealthy Tony party set um, that kind of also runs through this and also kind of adds to, a little bit to the chaos and and, and the intensity. Yeah. <clears throat> so, have they seen the book? Uh, Carl is not, uh, Carl, there's a copy on the way to Carl. Carl, um, and I were in touch a few weeks ago. Um, and Carl and I have an interesting relationship. I mean, we, as you mentioned, there was an article originally, there was a, this is about five years back. There was a quite a long article in the guardian, uh, that I wrote that was based on this. And Carl has a, um, um, there's been a couple people that have kind of, you know, dabbled on parts of his story, uh, before in particular with a focus on the on the swinging type thing that kind of uh, moves, uh, gets headlines. And, and so when I did the Guardian article, um, I don't want to say they were happy with the article. There was definitely things they were at, uh, angry about, but, but they didn't uh, stop talking to me. I, I, Hannah was actually uh, quite sensitive about the Guardian article because it did talk a bit about their swinging. She actually, when we had a uh, um, moderately hostile uh, uh, interaction after the article came out. But I think... Um, in the end, you know, I think, um, you know, Carol and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't call us friends, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, I developed, we had a relationship, developed a relationship together. And I think at, at some point, though, um, you know, there was something that clicked, a, you know, I'm speaking for him now that clicked with him a little bit, though, I'm putting words in his mouth. I think it's this is, is fair to say, though, that, um, that I was trying to do an honest job. Right. That I wasn't, um, you know, and, and I was ne and I was clear every time, you know, I'm I'm um, you might not like everything I write, but, um, you know, uh, you should believe that I'm trying to do it. So that's where we stand now. He's got a book uh, in transit, the European sort of shipment system that um, has sort of slowed it down. So I'm, you know, obviously both uh, uh, excited and anxious to hear what he has to say. I, I suspect he's kind of an ornery fellow. And so I suspect. Um, you know, the, the, um, most of the commentary will be on things that he did. He didn't like, but, um, you know, the fact uh, I'm confident he's going to contact me in the end though. And I think, you know, there's a, um, that there'll be some sort of dialogue about it. So, so, um, yeah, to be determined, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I think it, it even mentions in the book, one of his files says that he, goes off the handle, you know, easily, but then recovers quickly. Yeah, uh, so. that's right. <laughs> um, one of the real kind of, there's so many, the writing is great. And uh, as I said before, there are so many kind of novelistic elements in a, in a really positive way that flesh out um, what could have been a drier kind of more journalistic tale. And one of the writerly touches that I appreciated is that every chapter starts with an epigraph uh, a quote, you know, that uh, puts a spin uh, or, a, you know, somehow inflects the chapter. And so one of them is from Bertrand Russell. And the quote is, life is nothing but a competition to be the criminal rather than the victim. Um, do you think that this is what 
Carroll was doing? Was he fighting to take advantage of the people who were trying to take advantage of him? I, I think there's a, there, there's a, and actually I think then uh, the, the book ends uh, with a quote from Carroll that kind of is his own, I don't remember the exact quote. I have it in front of me. I can, maybe I can just read it to you. Um, there's a nihilistic streak to the whole thing. Um, a discourage it. Let's see. Here's this is the this is the last uh, line in the book, which I think, you know, kind of mirrors that. Um, so I ask him, uh, uh, do you consider? Uh, let's see. Okay. So this is um, simply. I'm not going to be a supporter. To be a supporter, it is about loyalty to yourself. I don't give a fuck about belonging. Sure, I would like to belong but there's nothing to belong to. So I think, you know, at some point, um, you know, and maybe it was early on, uh, this is, I guess, maybe something that's hard to answer. At what point does somebody kind of, does the switch flip and this guy says, you know, I'm, I, I'm out, this is, all this is about is survival. And is it um, when he's a kid, right? He's a kid and he's just not, um, this is what he's conditioned for, or is it, when he says, what the hell, I might as well, you know, become a spy and, and, and move to the States. Is it once he's in the States and kind of isn't, you know, haven't. So I guess the short, the short answer to, you know, the, the quotes are chosen for a reason. And I, I think that does. Yeah. I think that is, um, you know, uh, meant to reflect the sort of, the sort of skepticism that sets in, uh, in his own mindsets. Right. He does certainly, I'd say by the middle of the book, um, you know, not believe there's any real purpose to, to, to what he's doing, not believe that there's any real purpose to what most people are doing. And that, um, you know, he's kind of in this, in the deep end and nobody's on his team. And so every move is about balancing, um, you know, one side or the other side or a third side or a fourth side or a fifth side against the other to, you know, survive or to leave himself a, a back door to get out of a, a sticky situation or whatever. So, yeah, I think he does, you know, at some point, and I don't, it's hard for me to identify where that point is at some point that sort of becomes his, his, his mindset is his sort of, um, you know, everybody is out for themselves. Uh, nobody really believes in anything. Anyone that does believe in stuff believes in a myth or a lie. So therefore, you know, I might as well do what I have to do as well. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, he's, he's operating in this system that as we get through the 70s and the 80s and, you know, the system starting to come apart at the seams uh, and the, the complications of the spy game are just getting more and more Byzantine. You talk about, you know, these these spies get together and everyone assumes everyone else is wearing a wire. So they meet in the, in a sauna, right? So, uh, but it becomes this game of not only not being able to trust, but, you know, playing a kind of four dimensional uh, chess game and not to give away too much about in, from the book, but basically he essentially gets kind of decommissioned when he's right on the brink of being more valuable than ever before, but then gets you know, reinstated essentially. Um, and so there's so many twists and turns and ups and downs here. And the portrayal of him is very even handed. Um, but ultimately, do you think he was a success or a failure? That's a big question. Um, I mean, I guess I, it depends on what the, um, 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 you know, the mission Criteria. was. I don't, I don't, you know, I, I guess I have my doubts from the beginning that his motive, and I think it's portrayed this way in the book, you know, he, and he, he essentially gets this job and this uh, to go to the States in 1965. And I'm not sure that his motives for doing that were purely, you know, for love of country or for, um, you know, to, to, to deliver effective intelligence, you know, that, um, you know, I, I, I don't think, I don't think it, he was completely anti those ideas at that time, but I think it's a bit more that he sort of, um, um, you know, it's the old proverbial boiling of the frog thing. He's sort of in a situation. He, 
says, what the hell? This is better. Going to the States is more, is more exciting than what I'm doing now. I'll sort of do that. The temperature ratchets up. He's not noticing it. He makes another decision. The temperature ratchets. And it's this gradual. Th so, I, I mean, I, I'm not sure that I would call him a success. I would, I would say, though, the result is almost inevitable. I mean, I think that given the guy's makeup, given the situation he was in, I think it's also clear that his superiors didn't really have that much confidence in him. They were kind of just saying, this guy's crazy. Let's throw him out there and see, see if we catch, any, catch anything. And if he gets caught, no big loss to us either. Um, so I think, you know, I think it's a, it's a draw in some ways, you know, and rather success or failure, it's a draw. But it's also like, you know, the, 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 the input uh, that went into, Equal, you know, guarantees the output, both in terms of the personality, the backing he had, the time and place he was going to, the ask they were, you know, they had of him and, and these sorts of things. So complicated answer, um, but he's a complicated guy and it's a, it's a, it's a messy situation. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and, you know, so one of my favorite elements of uh, spy stories and everything is uh, the you know, some of the nitty gritty, the, the, the technology, the, the lengths that they go to, uh, to, you know, pass information or poison people, uh, or, you know, uh, prevent themselves from being poisoned or tailed. And the book goes into that in a lot of different ways. Can you talk about some of the kind of practical, you know, the, the cigarette packs and the soap bars and uh, the recent tablets and umbrellas and some of the practical spy technology that you uh, learned about in the research? Yeah, I mean, just the highlights, quick highlights without getting into the, the full, um, you know, the full, you know, where they fit in the story, but just kind of hit, hitting some colorful points. I mean, so Carl goes to the U.S., the, the STB sends him with a bar of soap and embedded in the bar of soap is a, is, a, is a cipher code that he's meant to use to, to, to decode, you know, shortwave radio transmissions at some future date. Um, as you mentioned, the cigarette packs, people are packing, uh, passing uh, uh, messages and leaving a pack of cigarette, Benson and Hedges, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, cigarettes um, on a, you know, on a mailbox in, on a city street that has, some papers in it. Someone else then drops the, another Benson and Hedges off over there with cash to 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 kind of make a switch. Um, there's a there's a some spy spy craft going on in Moscow itself. Um, there is the CIA has a, basically a rock. I mean, it's like a stone that's been hollowed out on the inside, so you can hide stuff inside. But by all accounts, resembles just a rock that would be on the side of the road or whatever. And so people are putting sort of, you know, communications and, and documents and the microfilm, literally microfilm in that, leaving that rock in a park, uh, park in a park in Moscow. And then someone comes in and gets there. It could be it's just a bunch of rocks on the side of a path in Moscow. And then the, the, the um, you know, maybe one one of the more, you know, um, darker twists in this story um, is a, there's a pen, Mont Blanc pen. Um, with a cyanide capsule in it that somebody uh, is said to have ingested uh, to commit suicide when they were, um, you know, under, under, the, under some heat from the KGB. So you kind of, there's a lot, I mean, they, and they kind of just, and there's a lot of interesting stuff about um, more practical stuff about how you lose a tail, you know, how they train someone to walk around blocks and make turn that, that it goes into there, a lie detector, how to beat lie detector tests. Um, so there's a lot of just, you know, you know, it's kind of spaced evenly throughout the story. And again, that's another one of these things you kind of come These are kind of um, little colorful details you come across as you're going through these files and these stories. And, and these are things that you see in movies and you kind of always, well, how does that work? Or is that, re is that a real thing even, right? I mean, it's, oh, that's just, that's, I heard about that. That's that's not a re poison pen. Poison pen, literally. A, 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 right. And so, yeah, there's um, some of these things really were that way. And it's kind of it's kind of. Um, it's interesting and it's also a little bit absurd. I mean, I think some of this story is, you know, some of when you drill down into these details, um, um, you know, there's a certain absurdity to a lot of this stuff uh, and that, you know, those are. You know, while I no doubt that these things served a function at key moments uh, here and there, um, 
there is a there is a there is a sort of cartoonish um, nature at times to some of it too that sort of um, hopefully comes across. Yeah, yeah, and um, it does. A lot of it does come down to human foibles ultimately, and we, you know, I think especially growing up in the U.S., we have these big ideas about uh, the Cold War and East versus West and these two very sophisticated, um, you know, world powers coming against each other. And when you, uh, you know, you've certainly more than scratched the surface, but when you, you, you dig into it, it's humans, flawed people making decisions about which they don't have much information and they're all kind of flying by the seat of their pants. Um, and the last chapter, the epilogue goes into detail a bit or kind of starts to meditate on what I think is one of the kind of latent questions throughout the book, which is, is as you said, about the lens of the Cold War, the lens uh, that we use to look through to, uh, you know, has determined the way we talk about history. Um, and, uh, you know, so from one point of view, someone might say, this guy, Carol Kocher, you know, he's a spy. He's a no good guy. He's the enemy. Um, why, you know, why bother uh, to even spend any time with him? Um, but obviously, as the story reveals, and 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 you know, uh, it's it's much more complicated than that. So, uh, it, it, and even in the in that epilogue, you talk a little bit personally about kind of reevaluating your own ideas and about the Cold War, the the narrative that you grew up with, uh, and you know this kind of dawning realization that a lot of that is really this an illusion essentially, um, or at the very least an oversimplification. Can you talk a little bit about that element of, um, you know, th the story and, and things being kind of more complicated than they seem, especially when it concerns the kind of that binary of us versus them in the Cold War? Yeah, I think the the, the thing that sort of the logical leap um, that I think that, you know, the per to me, there's two sort of things that are sort of um, uh, the, con the prevailing conclusions that we, um, uh, you know, popular uh, conclusions of, of what the Cold War was about or how the Cold War ended. And I find them difficult to reconcile at the same time. Um, maybe I'll preempt this by saying that obviously uh, I, I feel, uh, you know, fortunate to have grown up in the United States in the 1980s <laughs> and not the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, my wife, uh, Bibi, who the book is dedicated to, was born in, you know, communist Czechoslovakia. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm familiar with the, the, the um, you know, at least very close secondhand stories of, 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 of you know, uh, some of the, the flaws of the uh, late communist system. Um, but the two sort of, you know, conclusions that I think most people draw is, or, or, or you know, explanations we have. We have this explanation that um, the Soviet Union was, you know, doomed to fail. It was hollowed out on the inside. The system was totally flawed, um, you know, almost, almost laughable, right? Uh, you were making uh, shoes and, and missiles, but you didn't have enough bread to feed people and you only had, had size 11 shoes, right? And so, and people were lining up around the block and then they had to cut the toes out of their shoes or whatever, all these kinds. And if you showed up with a pair of jeans, people would, you know, give you a month's wage uh, for one pair of jeans. This is this, this sort of almost cartoonish, you know, late, uh, late Soviet Union picture. And then simultaneously, they were this massive evil threat to world peace. Uh, and it was only by the skin of our teeth. And, you know, Ronald Reagan put on this, this Superman cape and just, you know, Talk, gave some speeches and talked tough and, you know, quadru you know, quintupled the military budget. And, you know, that just broke their back of this, this massive, you know, you know, unstoppable force that could never have been stopped otherwise. Right. And those two things don't match up. And so, you know, I think, you know, neither of those is true. And, you know, there's some, there's some element, but my fear, and I think that's hopefully where I kind of leave it at the end is that, you know, so long as those both persist, you know, whatever, every decision we've made since then has been, you know, many foreign policy decisions in, in the United States, for example, have been based on those sort of underlying assumptions in the last 
40 years, 30 years. And um, that leads to, you know, a bad premise leads to bad results. And so, um, you know, if, if, if that narrative was correct, those narratives were correct, it would be the first time in the history of civilization that the first draft of history was correct. Uh, so I certainly was at least, I don't think I have an answer to, uh, to all these questions, but I certainly had the intent to, to at least um, attempt to, to ask the question, I think. Great, yeah, great. And I, I think you do more than that. I think it's a really excellent book um, that really contributes to uh, Cold War studies. And, and does more uh, is also just a great read. So on that note, I think we can maybe open it up to some of the audience questions. Yeah, we do have some questions from the audience. Uh, I would encourage you if you have a question for Benjamin, please feel free to submit it in uh, the Q&A. Our first question uh, is about the, sub the subtitle, uh, The Last Honest Man. What does this mean really? Yeah, it's a... Uh... The short answer first is we were trying to be trying to be witty uh, with the, with the title and subtitle, but um, I think as I touched you know touched on a bit earlier, but but um, maybe not explicitly. Um, you know, the, I'm doing all these interviews for this book. I'm interviewing Carl. I interviewed uh, the FBI agents who eventually were involved with tracking him. I inv and, and interviewed uh, you know other people who were in the intelligence community. I reviewed these files. Um, and, and, um, you know, even looking, let me even go a step further, even looking into, you know, the, 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 you know, the recorded history. So something like, uh, you know, John F. Kennedy ran for president, uh, claiming there was a missile gap, uh, or, uh, between the Soviet Union and the United States that the Soviet Union was, it was, was, you know, out producing the United States on, on, uh, you know, and terms of nuclear weapons, I think blatantly false, like the, at, the, at that exact time, the United States had, I think it's, the estimate is eight to 17 times more uh, uh, nuclear weapons in the Soviet Union in whatever, 1961. So um, any sort of attempt to sort of nail down the truth uh, in a clean way was really, really difficult here. And um, everyone, um, either was intentionally trying to mislead me or had sort of a rosy sort of view of their memories of the time. So in the end, I mean, the play on words is meant, is more or less meant to say uh, sort of everyone uh, kind of caught up in this, um, you know, it's a backwards situation. And in a backwards situation, uh, everyone resorts to lying and uh, deception and misleading. And in the end, in this story, and in a lot of Cold War stories, that is the, the endearing truth, uh, enduring truth that, that emerges, that, that um, lying was the default. Uh, the truth about the Cold War was that, um, you know, the incentives were often on the wrong side. They were to lie. They were to exaggerate. They were to mislead. And so in this way, um, you know, his story, his character is a pretty truthful uh, representation of not the most important historical events that were happening at the time, but it, it's emblematic of the times. And, and by, by tracking this guy, you get... Um, you get a feel for sort of the, the, the twisted insanity that was sort of the norm. There's, the next question is, um, did any of your, and I think maybe you touched on this a bit, but um, did any of your preconceived notions of the spy business get turned on their head after your research? Yeah, um, the, how uh, uh, I, I thought it was more professional than it is. Um, you know, I think, I think, um, you know, Stephen kind of said this as well. Um, and, and it's a real, um, ultimately, um, these are people kind of making decisions. And one of the, one of the more interesting sort of, you know, interesting to me, but not that interesting, you know, to the average person, you go through all these files. So I went through, uh, like 30,000 pages of files. Um, and most of them are 
completely bureaucratic and uh, meaningless. And you see reports and you see reports on something that happened. And then a year later, you see somebody else writing an updated report, quoting that earlier report. It's like they don't know that's true. They're just cutting and pasting from that earlier report because they need to file a report, right? It's like this really massive bureaucratic exercise that, o- that almost guarantees, you know, it's like the game of telephone, right? The kid's game of telephone. You start the message and you pass it down the line and what comes out the other side no longer resembles what started the, what started the chain of communication. So, you know, no doubt there are highly intelligent, highly ambitious people. There are um, people, you know, with with pure motives that are trying to do the right thing in these in these institutions. But the sheer size of the institution, the the kind of, you know, milieu that they have to operate in um, makes them really, really flawed. And um, and people are flawed and. Flawed people in flawed situations produce flawed results, and um, it becomes a little bit, you know, I don't know that anyone has like a super positive view of intelligence agencies, but given that they do, you know, impact global events on a pretty, you know, significant scale, um, you know, you you go through enough documents and you 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 wade deep enough into this, and it's discouraging. I mean, it it, it makes you feel like um, a little bit like maybe. You know, it's an, this is a, this is unrealistic prospect, but like, um, you know, the results will be just as good if you didn't have any intelligence at all or just as bad. Right. I mean, it, it, um, so, I mean, that may not be true, but you, you can't help but feel that way once you kind of, you know, I guess the, the, the classic, right. You know, once you, you see how the sausage is made, um, it's pretty, um, um, it's discouraging. Um, we have two more questions. Jeremy yep. asks, um, is there any part of the story that didn't make it into the final book that you wish could have made it into the, to the final book? That's a good question, Jeremy. Um, that may be my brother, Jeremy. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so you have to, you, you know, I had to cut off, um, right. The, the book ends, the guy's alive. It ends essentially, in the 80s, there's an, uh, the final chapter is, is, as Stephen alluded to, more contemporary. It's, a, it's me and him speaking, um, but there's a, you know, a pretty big gap between you know, the, the final 1986 and you know, when we are talking in 2016 or something in the, in the final uh, chapter. Um, so there's a lot of stuff that happens after that. I mean, um, there's a bizarre story that I kind of only have a, um, you know, a taste of because I didn't even, you know, get really deep into researching it. But an old friend of Carl's um, calls him up sometime in the late 90s and, and, um, and another guy from the spy, uh, kind of spy world, invites him to Vienna. Carl lives in, you know, near Prague. Vienna's about four hours, like driving to Chicago from Ann Arbor or something like that, a few hours away. And um, goes there, they're gonna meet up and have a, you know, reunion weekend, drink some beers or whatever. And the guy uh, turns up and says, I have this document here uh, that proves that um, uh, Princess Diana was assassinated. Uh, and so um, this um, bizarre sort of situation unfolds. Carl freaks out, gets in his car and drives directly back to Prague. Um, this guy uh, um, is arrested by, by the Austrian police and then ultimately uh, uh, deported to the U.S. to face trial for some. So um, Carl believes that the uh, CIA was trying to, uh, um, you know, ensnare him in this sort of sting operation to kind of bring him back because he kind of, um, I don't want to, I don't want to give away what happens, but uh, he's he's a free man at this time, and and they're not happy about that. Um, the his name actually appears. Carl's name actually appears as having been arrested, I believe, in the Guardian. Uh, so there was somebody reporting to the press that he was arrested in the sting operation already. So this, there's, and, and that's just an insane story that, that, um, you know, I have, I have more details than I'm, I'm saying now, but, um, you know, just wasn't able to get in and, and didn't, because it wasn't going to make it in, didn't dedicate the time to really get in deep into it. Maybe that's something that I do in the future, just out of curiosity, but I had to choose kind of, you know, like a movie or anything like that. There needs to be a beginning, middle and an end. And so, you know, it had to cut off kind of, you know, the decision was to cut it off 
we're cut off. Wow, that's, that's a crazy story. Um, so we have one time for one last question. Um, and a viewer writes, spying, swinging, double agenting, and over 70 years of marriage. If you caught Carol in a reflective mood, uh, what would you say is the key to a successful marriage? Um, it's an interesting question. Um, I don't know that he would have, uh, I don't know that he, I don't know that his mind works that, that, um, you know, uh, emotionally, um, or, uh, you know, I'm sure he has got, I think, um, I gotta say, I think in a different time, uh, in a different, if this story had started, if this, you know, if this story, you know, 1965, when they moved to the States, if, the, if this same story repeated and they were moving to the States in 2022, I don't think they, their marriage would have survived. So I think there's some element here of, um, you know, the times people just didn't get divorced. Um, and there certainly were some times in the States. Um, and then they sort of get into this, this um, uh, you know, spouse swapping party scene where I think things are sort of, um, you know, on edge um, for years. Um, and they're under intense pressure. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, you know, weird uh, Petri dish to be, um, you know, going through a marriage in. Um, and then I think that basically at that point, because they were so dependent on one another, they were both sort of out at sea and they only had one another and they, um, you know, tradition did not, uh, account for divorce uh, so easily at the time they kind of muddled, uh, through that maybe didn't even see it as an option to split up. And then came out the other side. And I think essentially, I think probably where they are now and where they were after that was, you know, how, you know, after going through that sort of intense experience that no one else could possibly, you know, sympathize with or even understand in the light, it's almost impossible, you know, for them to split up at that point. So I don't know, uh, uh, attrition, maybe if I did, what is the, what is the key to a successful marriage? Attrition. <laughs> Uh, well, we've reached the top of the hour. Um, Stephen Delbos, Benjamin Cunningham, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, very early in the morning <laughs> in Europe, um, but this evening here at, at Home of Literati, uh, we hope we can have you both in the store in the not too distant future for, for, for another conversation. And to all of our attendees, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at our next event. Have a great night. Great night, everybody, and take care. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night.